Please be seated. Thank you for both of you greeting me with the good morning. We will start it again. Good morning. Christ is alive. Did you hear me? He's alive. The cross was not his downfall. It was his victory. 
The darkness of his tomb does not conceal him. He's not there. The rock has been rolled away. He is risen. He's alive. Acts 13.30 is true. And God raised him from the dead. Jesus Christ did not raise himself because he was dead. But today, Easter, we prove that God is victorious over death. Amen? Amen. There are just a couple of things that I want to remind everyone. We have our mask. We're going to ask you to keep those on above uh, your nose. And then uh, we want you to sing, too. Okay? That's just between me and you. And other than that, we want to remember Mickey and Hank Korea this week. They are celebrating 47 years of a, a marriage, and God has blessed them and blessed them big. So God bless you. We also want to remember Shirley and Jim Knight, who are celebrating 64 years of being married. That is quite an achievement. Can I tell you that your associate pastor isn't even 64 years old yet? So... No, not bragging. Who said that? Was that an elder? Oh, okay, yeah, it was an elder. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and call us your children. Heavenly Father, no matter how old we are, we are always looked at as your child, your favorite son and your favorite daughter. We would invite your spirit to be in this sanctuary today. We thank you, God, for our musicians and our singers. We thank you for our technicians, our uh, volunteers, our security, and our ushers. And then, Heavenly Father, we would ask that you would let your spirit fall heavy upon our pastor as he brings the message of Easter to us. Holy Spirit, teach us what you want us to know today. And when we leave this church, let us be able to say, it was good to be in the house of the Lord. And all of God's children said, Amen. let's sing. to all of you. It's so wonderful to see so many of you out there today. We're going to be reading now responsibly from 1 Corinthians 15. Diane is going to read the white, and we invite you to read with us responsibly in the yellow. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. 
For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. And if Christ is not raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives, he gives us, us victory, victory through, through our, our Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. May he bless us on this resurrection day. seated. Psalm 122.1, David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It has been a year since I've seen some of your faces. God bless Lincoln Community Church. Amen. Amen. God bless you for coming. Lord knows that pastor and I will, when there's nobody in the sanctuary, we come in here and we preach, we practice, but it's so much nicer when I see your faces. Amen, Pastor? Amen. Even Pastor likes you. So, 
We want to remember some of the church family in our prayer. Sherry Walker uh, had surgery. She's in the rehab uh, facility now. And so let's continue to pray for her good health and a quick recovery. We want to pray, pray for the family of Norma McKee who passed away last month. We pray that God's peace would fall upon that family. And here on Easter, we want to pray for our church. We want to pray that God would continue to use the men and women, that we would strengthen one another by our meeting together. And we would be so bold as to tell God, thank you in advance for what he's doing in our church. Amen? Amen. Say it like you mean it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that we've seen today. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the hope that we have for tomorrow. We would ask your blessing upon the singers and the musicians today who give of their time and their talent to glorify your name. We would ask for your wisdom for our pastor as he brings your Easter message to us. And then, Lord, we would pray for our church Let us continue to be a lighthouse to this community in these dark times. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would grant our requests for the glory of your name as we recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. This song is a passionate story of that Easter morning from Peter's point of view. I pray it blesses you. The gates and doors were barred and all the windows fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness and rose at every sound. Half in hope of sorrow And half in fear the day you would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away. Then just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. The gate began to rattle and a voice began to call. I hurried to the window, looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches the sound of soldiers' feet. But there was no one there but Mary, so I looked down to let her in. John stood there beside me as she told me where she'd been. She said they'd moved him in the night and none of us knows where. The stone's been rolled away and now his body isn't there. So we both ran toward the garden and John ran on ahead we found the stone an empty tomb just the way that Mary said but the winding sheet they'd wrapped him in was just an empty shell and how were they taken him was more than I could tell oh something strange happened there just what I did not know John believed a miracle, but I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high, because I'd seen them crucify him. And then I saw him die. Back inside the house again, the guilt and anguish came. Everything I promised him just added to my shame. When at last it came to choices, I didn't know I knew his name. So even if he was alive, he would never be the same. Then 
Suddenly the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume. The light that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room. And Jesus stood before me with his arms all open wide. And I fell down on my knees and I just clung to him and cried. into his eyes the light was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies guilt in my confusion disappeared in sweet release and every fear I'd ever had just melted into peace he's alive he's alive he's alive he's alive he's alive he's Thank you, Nancy. And you are alive. <laughs> wow. What a blessing. And you have no idea how much she worked on that and all she went through to be ready for this morning. Thank you. God bless you. Okay. Well, it is, I can't tell you what it's like to be up here and see all of you out here today. It is, it is extraordinary, and we had it wonderful in the first service of great attendance there, too. This has been an unbelievable year, isn't it? And it's so good to be on Sundays now. The only bad thing is that i got to totally get reused to my weekend. I, I, I have to do my vacuuming of the house on Saturdays now. You know? <laughs> anyway, it's great to be here with the Lord's people and in his house. But, you know, this past year has is, is been wild. It's been like taking a box of a thousand pieces of puzzle and throwing them all up in the air and trying to make sense of the whole thing. You know, you wonder, what is, what's God doing? And yet you and I know, as the scriptures say to us, God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so, so we trust whatever is going on in this year, God is about doing things. But uh, you know that first Easter, uh, those disciples, the, the 11 that were left, Judas by then had hung himself, but the disciples and the women, it was all confusing. Uh, well, how to make sense of the whole thing. When you came in today, you probably saw a picture out there of the risen Christ. If you look closely enough, you would have seen that it was actually a puzzle that was put together. It's actually a wooden puzzle, not one of the cardboard ones. And it was put together by Chuck and Kathy Mayo, and they, they then framed it and gave it to us at our church. And it's a magnificent picture of Jesus. But it reminds us that for those early believers, it was a puzzlement. What was the point of all, trying to make sense of this? And, and when Jesus died on that cross, that Good Friday, the disciples and all of his followers were shattered. Not only did it seem like a puzzle, but they were like so many shattered pieces of a puzzle. But then it was Sunday. And little by little, they began to put the puzzle together. 
And you and I are here today, and we cry out along with those people, Ah! It makes sense! He's risen! We put the puzzle together. But I got a question for you. When you say he is risen, what do you mean? What do we mean? Tomorrow's Monday. Will the resurrection be like a puzzle that we put together and we've said he is risen, but now we all throw it back in the box and put it away for a year? Or does it mean something more deep within our soul as well as should? I want to suggest to you today as we think about this day that when we say he is risen, we're really saying certain things have happened in our life, certain things have taken place and will never be the same again. What does it mean when I say he is risen? Well, for one, it means that you and I have gone to see for ourselves. Now, so often we come to Easter and, and we know what this day is about. And it's a thrill for all of us to be here. But what does it mean to us? That was the question for those early believers. Matthew tells us that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they went to the tomb. And they went to finish the burial process that had, been, had begun with uh, Jesus when he was taken down. But because it was Passover, they couldn't finish it. So now they were going back to finish putting the ointment on him and the, the various spices and, and make sure his body was entombed properly. And of course, it tells us when they got there, <laughs> an angel rolled back the stone and he sat on it and his appearance was like lightning and white as snow. And the angel said to the women, he's not here. He's risen. Kind of like, you should know this. He's risen. Come and see. And of course they did. And they run back and they tell the disciples and John kind of gives us a little bit of the humorous account of Peter and John running to the tomb. And, and John is just a little lighter on his feet. I always take it, he's just a little bit younger. I always, my picture of Peter is just a great big burly guy. So usually those guys, they play the line and uh, they run a little slower than the scat backs. Maybe John was like that. But he got to the tomb first, and he looked inside, and he, all he saw was the strips of linen lying there. And of course, then Luke tells us that Peter finally got there, so he looks in and saw the strips of linen lying on them by themselves, and he went away wondering, what happened? What's happened? And you see, they didn't understand. They didn't understand from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. No matter how many times Jesus told them, they didn't get it. But that's okay. Because you see, that's where faith always begins. It begins by going and looking. Maybe not having all the answers and maybe not even ready to believe. But at least I'm going and I'm looking. I'm not just listening to what mom or grandma told me. And so I went to church when I was a kid at Easter. And yeah, I know something about Easter and, and Jesus rose. But that's as far as it gets. No, faith begins by going myself and examining things. And it was that way for Lee Strobel. Many of you have read this book. Strobel wrote a book around 1990, uh, somewhere in the early 90s, called The Case for Christ. If you've read it, you know the story. Probably one of the best books written in the last 30 years that defends the faith. But Strobel was a reporter. He had a degree in law and in journalism, and he wrote for the Chicago uh, paper. And uh, his wife became a believer. Oh, my goodness. What are we going to do? Strobel thought, oh my, now I'm married to a Jesus freak. This is going to upset my life, and it may even ruin our marriage. So he decided to, to listen a little bit, and he noticed his wife was different. The way she treated him and the children, it was a new character for her. So it intrigued him. So he finally decided to go to church with her. He said, if for no other reason so I could talk her out of this cult. So he went. And he heard the message. And when he walked out, he said, I'm still an atheist, but I got to tell you, if this thing is true, 
<laughs> this could really change my life. So what he did was he set about something that took him almost two years to do an investigation about Jesus and the resurrection. And he went all over the country interviewing various uh, theologians and uh, Bible teachers and uh, finding out about the, the history of Jesus, the historical basis for the resurrection. The upshot of the whole thing is when he was done, he said, I, I've been an atheist, but frankly, after all this, I would have to swim upstream against the torrent of evidence pointing towards the truth of Christ. I couldn't do that. He said, I was trained in journalism and the law to respond to the truth. And so on November 8, 1991, Lee Strobel stood up in church and walked forward and gave his life to Jesus Christ. That's where faith begins, being willing to examine the evidence, being willing to go and look for ourselves and not depend upon what somebody else tells me about Jesus. That may be the start of it, but I've got to look for myself. And where does that, where does that lead me? Then it leads me to the second thing. When I say he is risen, it means that I stand in wonder. I've gone to look and I've seen the truth. Now I stand in wonder. And that's what happened for the couple of men, people on the road to Emmaus. Luke tells us about it in the 24th chapter. We don't know who these two strangers were, these two disciples. One, it says one of them's name was Cleopas, but that's about as much as we know. But Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, comes up on them, and they don't recognize him. Now, we don't know why he didn't rec they didn't recognize him. It may be that they're so downcast in their grief, they're just not paying any attention. Maybe they never occurred to them that they would see Jesus. They remembered the beaten, bruised, and bloody Jesus on the cross, maybe. And here was Jesus. And so they're talking, and he's, he's telling them the scriptures. He's saying to them, don't, don't you know it was all promised? And he takes them through the scriptures. And, and then eventually, as they're walking along, say, look, come on over to our house. Let's do lunch, and they'll have a meal together. And so they ate. Somewhere in the midst of the meal, it suddenly dawns on them, this is Jesus. Maybe the scales from their eyes are gone. And then shortly afterwards, he leaves. Listen to the statement they made. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked? And he opened the scriptures to us. That's what happens when we get confronted with the truth and we allow the truth to confront us. Suddenly, there's a discomfort. There's an unrest in my heart, and I stand and I wonder. That evening, Jesus appeared to all of his disciples in the upper room. That is, minus Thomas, and we'll talk about him in a little bit. But it says, Jesus came and stood among them, and he showed them his hands and his side. And then it says the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. <laughs> Boy, that is an understatement, that word glad. I was glad when you were all here today. <laughs> but that, that word that's used there is translated in a lot of different ways. If you look at different translations, one says he rejoiced. Well, I rejoiced when you were here today. And another one says he was overjoyed. Well, I, I was really overjoyed when you got here today too. And then it says... He was exuberant. Well, I've been exuberant. This is terrific to see all of you here. But another translation says, I'm amazed. Well, I'm a little amazed. I was worried you were all getting used to just sitting home and being comfortable and watching us on the screen. <laughs> this is wonderful. But, you know, put it all together, my translation would be something like this. The disciples were joyfully stunned. Now, I wasn't joyfully stunned by you being here, but I am thrilled. But they were joyfully stunned when they saw the Lord. When we go to examine the tomb and when we examine the evidence and we're confronted with the truth, we begin to stand in wonder. One person that was uh, stunned was the actor Jim Caviezel. How many of you remember this movie, The Passion of Christ? How many of you saw that movie? I have it. I think I've watched it three times, but I can't bring myself to watch it another time. It's so powerful. Um, usually, if I do watch it, I fast forward to the resurrection. Do you remember the resurrection scene? 
best scene in the whole thing. All of a sudden, the sheet just floats down. <laughs> but Jim Caviezel tells a story, and Jim Caviezel is a very committed Christian. When he was asked to play this role, and he accepted it, a few days later, Mel Gibson, the producer, called him and said, are you sure you want to do this? Well, yes. I really think God wants me to do this. He said, well, you need to remember. If you do this role, you're liable not to have another, another chance in Hollywood. And that has somewhat come true. Well, he said, I determined that I, God wanted me to do this, and so he did it. And, and, and the, he'll tell you the story. This was not a simple thing. Uh, during the course of the whole thing, he dislocated a shoulder while he's carrying that cross. Uh, the beating, you remember the beatings? Well, while he had padding and stuff on, he nevertheless experienced a lot of bruising, and, and, and it took its toll. And then at one point, when he's there on the cross, they had a storm, and he was struck by lightning. You haven't heard about that, have you? He was struck by lightning. And everybody was, you know, they immediately went, they were, he was dead. No, he was alive. It profoundly impacted his life, and while he acted in the passion of the Christ, his life became a passion for Christ. And today he goes around churches all over the country and he shares his testimony. Because you see, the confrontation with the truth of the resurrection and to say it is risen for him, it makes him stand and wonder. Your life's just not the same again. I love that couple things he says. Let me read them to you. And of course, it was, he was told that when you, if you take this role, your, your career in Hollywood may be over. He says, I would, rather be, I would rather my name be unknown down here and have my name known up there. I think amen goes there. Amen? amen. Absolutely. And then he says this, we have to give up our names, our lives, our reputations to speak the truth. The resurrection does that to us. That's what it means when I say he is risen. But it also means I won't let him go. Once I've been confronted with the truth, I've examined it for myself, and I stand and wonder, I say then I cannot let go. It was that way for the women when they met Jesus shortly after he'd risen. It says, he says, greetings. They came to him and they clasped his feet and they worshipped him. They, wouldn't let, they didn't want to let him go. The same thing happened that night with the disciples. There in the upper room, Jesus came and stood among them, and he showed them his hands and his side. And what, is it, what happened to them as a result of that? John will talk about it years later, probably about 60 years later. He writes in his first epistle, very beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen, what our hands have touched and handled, we proclaim about the word of life. We can't let go. And it's that been that way ever since. And in the record of the early centuries of the church, when it was under so much persecution, over and over again, you read about people who at the cost of death would not let go. One of those was a man by the name of Polycarp. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. Smyrna is in western Turkey today. And persecution arose, and he was sentenced to die at the stake. But he was a man in his 90s. In fact, he'd been a disciple of the Apostle John. The magistrate of Smyrna, the last thing he wanted to do was burn an old man at the stake, and he begged him to recant. <clears throat> Polycarp would not recant. This is what he said. For 86 years I've served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? He went on to say, you threaten me with fire that burns for a season and after a little while is quenched, but you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that's prepared for the wicked. I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour so that in the company of the martyrs I may share the cup of Christ. Something happens to us when we truly discover that he is risen. I will not and cannot let him go. But then also, it means that there's been a change in my heart. It happened that way for all the disciples. I want to talk about three of them. 
First Thomas. We all know Thomas, the doubter. Thomas is the one that was not in the upper room when Jesus first appeared to them. And then later in the day, Thomas finally shows up. We don't know where he was. I, I kind of feel like Thomas was nursing his doubts and, and discouragement and despair. Uh, he, was, he was passionate in his commitment to Jesus. There's one point when Jesus is going back to raise Lazarus from the dead, and, and the disciples say, no, don't go back. Don't you know that they're, they're gunning for you in town? They're looking to, to kill you. And he says, no, we'll go. And Thomas says, then let us go and die with him. No, Tom, Thomas did not lack passion. But he's one of those intellectuals. And he didn't know what to do with what he saw when Jesus died. And so, like many like that, he's got to be alone and think it through. So he wasn't there that night. Later in the evening, he shows up, and the other disciples, they're falling all over themselves. You should have been here, Thomas. He was here. He's risen. And Thomas says, ah, if he's risen. I'm not believing that until I, I get to see him myself and get my, put my hands in his wounds and his side. One week later, Jesus shows up. You know the story. He says, Thomas. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting, Thomas, and believe. And you heard what he said. My Lord and my God. Resurrection does that to us. Another one's Peter. Boy, all of us feel like we feel the Lord sometimes, don't we? You don't even come close. You know the story of Peter. Bold Peter the night before the crucifixion, he's telling Jesus, you know, all the rest of these guys, you know, they can deny you, but I will never deny you. And Peter said, I mean, Jesus said, oh, is that right? Before the cock crows tomorrow morning, you will have denied me, denied me three times. And of course, you know the story, he did. I have a picture, there's a picture that I love. It's a picture that shows Peter standing by the fire. He has just denied Jesus the third time. And off in the distance, Jesus is standing in the midst of the Sanhedrin. He's got his hands tied. And he suddenly looks at Peter as Peter utters those words. The gospel writer, I think it's Luke, says that Peter then went out and he wept bitterly. Nobody ever failed Jesus worse. But that wasn't the end of the story. I always kind of picture... When, when Jesus first showed up in the upper room with the disciples, I always kind of picture Peter hanging around in the back. Because Peter's always the first one to talk. You don't hear a peep out of peeper, Peter. I like that. No peep from Peter. <laughs> you don't hear anything from him. But a little later, when they're up there in Galilee, Peter says, I'm going fishing. And they're out fishing one night, and suddenly they bring in this huge haul of fish. And Peter, he sees Jesus. He's standing on the shore. He's got a fire going. He says, come on in, guys. Let's, let's have a fish fry. And they do. All of a sudden, there comes a point when Jesus comes over to Peter. He says, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> you know the story. Three times he says to Peter, do you love me? Why do you think he said it three times? Because Peter denied him three times. Peter got the message. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Jesus says, then just go feed my sheep. <laughs> this must have had an extraordinary impact on Peter and changed his life because some 30 some years later when he is in probably in Rome and he is not long before he's arrested and tried and he will be convicted and he along with Paul will be martyred but he writes a letter to the believers and he says clothe yourselves with humility actually he says you young men because <laughs> he knows what young men are like because he was one. Clothe yourself with humility, for God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The most important thing I can tell you that I learned in knowing Jesus in the day I realized he was risen 
is that God is opposed to the proud. And I was so proud and I was so cocky and I was so arrogant and I thought I had it all together. I didn't. But God is opposed to the proud, but oh, did he give grace to the humble. Which is his way of saying, God humbled me and he broke me. I'll never be the same again. There is something humbling about coming to the empty tomb and acknowledging that I don't have all the answers. But when I examine all the evidence and all the suggested solutions to why the body was gone, which none of them hold very much water, I have to admit that it must be true. I don't have the answers, I don't have them all. But Jesus, I believe. It changes our hearts. And then of course there's one other guy, <laughs> Paul the persecutor. Paul never forgot that he was a persecutor of the church. He used it in his testimony frequently. In Acts 26, we find him standing before some Roman officials. And he's telling his story. And he said, I was on the Damascus Road. And all of a sudden, this blinding light. And then there's this voice. And it says, Saul, Saul. That was Paul's name before. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Later, he'll say, I persecuted the church of God. He never got over this. But then he says in 1 Timothy, he says, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me. I, the worst of sinners, was shown mercy. Sometimes I like to think of Paul and Peter getting together and debating who was the worst. <laughs> Peter said, well, I denied him. Well, Paul said, well, you may have denied him, but I persecuted him. Well, but the grace of God changed their lives. It does that. Let me tell you a story. Remember this picture? The napalm girl. Any of us who lived during that period of the Vietnam War, which I think we all did, you'll never forget this picture. It's a young Vietnamese girl. Her name, Kim Phuc Phan Thi. She was just 10 years old there. The South Vietnamese had napalmed, bombed her village. And this picture, I don't show everything, but she's running totally naked. She's burned. Everything's gone. There are other children running there, too. Horrific. Ten years later, this is 1973, ten years later, she's searching for answers. And Jesus changes her heart. She said, the, the religion of my ancestors and uh, my family didn't give me the answers. And so she said, in 1982, I found myself sitting on the floor in a library in Saigon. And I, I pulled down all of these books and I'm looking at books on religion and I'm reading about everything. And, and she said, one of the books I pulled down was a Bible. And somehow when I opened it, it turned to the Gospels and I started reading about Jesus' life and I couldn't stop reading about his life. And suddenly God began showing me. He said he was the way, the truth, and the life. And I looked at how he died, and then it tells me he did that for me. And suddenly the Holy Spirit began changing her heart, started witnessing to her. And she came to the place where she understood. And on Christmas Eve in 1982, in Saigon, she stood up and gave her life to Jesus Christ. I'm a new creation. Today, she goes around giving her testimony. She started a foundation that works with young gals and young ladies who've been through some horrific things. But always Jesus is the answer. When we say he is risen, we mean he's changed my life. But there's one more thing. It also means we have a story to tell. We see that over and over again. When the, when the women first were confronted, the angel said, go quickly, tell his disciples he has risen from the dead. Later, Jesus will appear to them and say, don't be afraid, go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The disciples and the women, when they came back from the tomb, the women came back and 
told the eleven all the things they'd seen. When Jesus was ascended, when he finally was leaving the disciples, he said, one more thing I'm going to say to you. You are my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They must have taken him seriously. The very next chapter, Peter preaches that great message of Pentecost, and he says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Then in the third chapter, when Peter has healed a man, a lame man, all these people are gathered there in the temple precincts, and he says to all these Jewish people, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses. Then in the fifth chapter, when Peter and John are hauled before the Sanhedrin, and they're, they're commanded to stop preaching this Jesus, and Peter says, well, it's, whether it's right to obey you or obey God, we've got to do what God tells us to do, and we will not stop telling the gospel. And then he says this, God exalted him to his own right hand as a prince and savior. We are witnesses of these things. All the believers must have taken that seriously because when you come to the eighth chapter, when persecution first begins to emerge and the, and the believers are scattered, it, it tells us there that there was such a persecution that arose that the believers had to scatter. The disciples, the apostles all stayed there in town. But the believers scattered, and it says, they who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. The word means to proclaim and to tell. That's what happens. When we come to the tomb and discover the truth, and we stand in wonder, and we say, I will never let him go because my heart has been changed. Now I have a story to tell. Well, let me wind this up. I tell this story every Easter because it never ceases to impact me. William Sangster, W. E. Sangster was a great preacher, British preacher, lived in the first half of the 20th century. He was British, he was a Methodist. And uh, late in his life, in the 1950s, he contracted a, uh, a muscular atrophy disease and his muscles began to waste away. There was nothing they could do about it, it's incurable. He began to have difficulty swallowing and eating. Eventually, he couldn't even speak. So he prayed, Lord, if I can't be a general in your army, at least let me be a lieutenant or a private. Just let me be of service. So he continued to write devotionals and various things for the mission organization. But near the end, he couldn't even hold a pen anymore without shaking. On Easter in 1960, just two weeks before he died, he wrote a letter to his daughter, Margaret. He said, Dear Margaret, how sad to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice with which to shout, He is risen. But, oh, Margaret, how much sadder to have a voice and not want to shout, He is risen. That's what this day is about. I hope you can shout, he is risen today. I hope that that change has happened for your heart because you've looked at the record and through the witness of the Holy Spirit, there's a conviction that this is true. I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers, but I'll tell you what is there is more than enough to win a case in court. Lord, you've changed my life. So I have a story to tell. I want to close our service this morning with the Hallelujah Chorus, but we're going to do it a little differently. I'm going to show you a video. Now we do a, Christians do a really weird thing. I don't know if you know this or not. We always sing the Hallelujah Chorus at Christmas. And I'm going to still do it because I like the Hallelujah Chorus. But you know the Hallelujah Chorus is not about the birth. It's about the resurrection. It's an Easter song. So I'm going to show you a video here today. And actually, all the decorations around are all Christmas. But it took place at the big shopping mall of where Macy's is in Philadelphia. And that's where they have the big Wanamaker organ, which Jim just wants to go play someday with all of his heart. <laughs>
And they did the hallelujah chorus. And what is stunning, you got to watch this. All these people in this mall, it's Christmas time, there's Christmas shopping. And all of a sudden, they start hearing the organ, and they start hearing the choir. And they, there's a little humor, they're laughing. But by the end of it, there is a wonder, and they're all singing it. I sometimes think of someday when Jesus returns, that's the way it's going to be in the world. We're all going to be doing our thing. But suddenly, we hear the voice of the angels. Wow. Let's watch it. Sing the Hallelujah Chorus without standing up. So.
For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. And with the voice of the archangel and with a trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Let's pray. Our Father, today is such a glorious thing to be able to gather in Jesus' name and to say he is risen and mean it. Thank you because you live, we live, and we will live. As you said, Lord, you're the resurrection and the life, and he that believeth in you, though we were dead, yet will he live. And then you ask us, do you believe this? Yes, Lord, we believe. Help us in our unbelief. Help us in our confusion. Help us in our despair. Hope in the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. And may we go with your peace now. You said, your peace you give to us. Not as the world gives, but your peace. And that we must not be discouraged because you have overcome the world. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. And let me, um, we have a lot of these Easter lilies up here. If you would like to take one home, please feel free to do that. God bless you. Go in peace.